So I'm an art teacher, right? Can you draw people? They're kind of hard to draw. I'm not so sure I can either. I used to teach how to draw people, and it's all I made it all com complicated. But Jesus can draw people. Did you know that that Jesus can draw people? Sure, he can. Yeah. It says right in the Bible. John 12, 32, as for me, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. See there? Jesus can draw people. Oh, yeah, of course, not that kind. But you can see how if you were to do a translation, you can really make a mistake and goof it all up. If you change the meaning, you can even do that if you don't know what the words mean, if we're not careful. And today I'm going to take us through one case that this week that befuddled me. Remember last week I told you we're going to look at some of the details in this passage because it's so condensed with all sorts of important information. And these, this one verse is craziness. And so I tried to figure it out. And I uh, tried to translate a word, and I was wrong, as usual. <laughs> I'm going to take you through what happened. Dave Stabno helped me. I put it on Facebook, and I got this whole thread of people. And Dave Stabno chimed in, and I asked him to. And, and he's one of the scholars who translated that our pew Bible, the Holman, so he knows a little bit about this. So I'm going to have us play pretend today. You're going to be a committee of translation. That's kind of how they do this. They do it with committees. And I'm going to make a presentation of what I think verse 32 is, how it should be translated, and you're going to judge whether you think it's accurate or not. And I, Of course, I already have Dave on my side, so there. <laughs> I think you folks who like words are going to like this. I thought it was pretty, pretty adventurous myself. All right, so here's our text, John 12, 32. It says, as for me, Jesus is speaking, as for me... If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Now, last week we looked at what the phrase means when I am lifted up from the earth. We looked at lifting up Jesus. This week, we're going to look at what draw all people to myself means. And I was befuddled by three words in this phrase. One question is about the word people. And another is about the meaning of the word all. And finally, we finish up with how Jesus draws and what it means for people. Okay, let's look at people first. <laughs> As I began this study, I was shocked to learn that the word people isn't there in the original language. The original reads, I will draw all to myself. That's awkward English, and you wouldn't translate it that way. It needs some noun there after all. All what? So I compared versions. That's what I say to do, right? Compare versions, see what different versions say. And you know what? Most of the English versions supplied a word for what wasn't there. Hmm. The more word-for-word -word versions supplied men, and the more readable version supplied the word people. So what gives? Now here's the problem I had. You know I'm always harping on when you're going to interpret the Bible, you have to do it by the context. What comes before it in the text and what comes after it in the text, whatever your question is, what comes before and what comes after, as well as trying to understand what the cultural context is. So. I did that. So now let's look at these verses that come before, verses 31 to 33. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to signify what kind of death he was about to die. So, what's the context? Judgment. Shouldn't the added word be judgment then? It would say that Jesus draws all judgment to himself, and that's, that goes with our doctrine. Jesus takes the sins of the world upon himself, right? That's judgment. So I tried asking Google, you know, you can do that, and, and I got a bunch of threads and from Yahoo and all over the place and some Bible 
study threads. And, and I found some other people wondering about this too, and, and several who thought, yeah, the word judgment should be there because of the context. It just made sense. And so, why do none of the virgin versions use the word judgment? They all have the word men or people, or they've just left it blank. I figured there's something going on in that original language that I didn't understand. So, here's something that helped me understand it. You know, I, I have this, in my cell phone, I have this uh, program for learning languages, and this is called Duolingo, and I, I've been learning Spanish really, really slowly, but I do it just for fun, mostly. And I learned something about it. I keep having trouble with something in Spanish that English doesn't have, and so it's hard to remember it. Maybe when you've taken a foreign language, you've had the similar problem. Spanish words have gender. Nouns, adjectives, and verbs are masculine or feminine or neuter, all of them. Greek does too. Greek has gender. And it's confusing to me. Spanish, Greek, and English also have number. All of us have number, singular or plural, you know. Now, I'm always tripping up in Spanish because I forget that the adjectives and verbs have to have the same gender and number as the noun. They have to agree in gender and number. If you don't, they don't agree, it's wrong. <clears throat> same thing in Greek. Gender and number have to agree in the nouns, verbs, and adjectives. So now, I saw that the word all is plural and masculine. It needs, then, a plural masculine noun to stick in that place. It can't be all creation, which some people thought it was. He draws all creation. That's singular and feminine. It can't be he draws all things. Things are neutral. So regardless of the context this time, the word all cannot be referring to judgment because judgment is feminine and singular. You get this or am I leaving you all? <laughs> all right, it needs to be masculine and plural. Judgment is feminine and singular, so it won't work. They have to agree because the word all is masculine. It needs the word men. That's why every version translated men or people. So that's why I was wrong, sticking judgment in there. All right, we're not quite finished, though. So why doesn't the word all in the Greek have men after it? Why do they just leave it blank? It makes no sense. Now again, that's like Spanish. If I say, yo hablo espanol, that means I speak Spanish. But I don't need to put that, the yo is like the I. I don't need to put that in there because the verb hablo already has the I in it. That's what the O is. It, that O means I. And so you can just get rid of the yo altogether and just say hablo espanol. You get it? The English doesn't have this, uh, this ability because we don't have all these things that are in our verbs. So it's the same thing with all. All doesn't need a word after it because the word men is already in the word all because it's a masculine word. And so the only word that it can possibly be there is men if you're going to translate it into English. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me like, what? <laughs> I wondered if it was too complicated. English needs to have a noun after that word all because we don't have all this stuff within our, all these words. But we do sometimes let it hang there by itself. 
Dave Stabner explained it. He says, if I say there's a party tonight and all are welcome, you'd have to supply some kind of category for that generic all, right? And he says, it's going to be people, it's not going to be penguins, right? All are welcome. You assume that it means all people. That's the same thing going on in this verse. So, to translate the word, to translate this phrase into English, we have to have the word men. So translators say all men. Isn't that cool? I thought so anyway. So why do some translations use the word people? It's because we don't, English has changed. We don't use men as meaning both men and women so much anymore. So now we use people. And so the more readable versions, the more contemporary versions put people in there because it's really more accurate. Because it's not talking, in this case, about just the male, <laughs> the guys. All right. So once again, we see that translations in English are correct. And if you have a deviation, you are wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong. That always happened. When I was translating Hebrew, it was always the same way. Oh, this is cool. Look, this is so interesting and, and different than everybody else. And it's like, no. Nope. It's wrong, because it's, they, they know what they're doing, right? We can trust our English translations. That's my bottom line. Does that tell us anything about what the verse means? <laughs> no, not yet. That was just about translation. Now we do interpretation. We need to figure out what Jesus means when he says he draws all people to himself, and he doesn't mean he's doing it with a pencil. We need to understand the word draw. Of course, we all know what it means. It means that Jesus pulls people or attracts people, right? We got that. He does it because he was lifted up from the cross and ascended into heaven and in, in sent his spirit and he draws people. We know that's what the word draw means here. But the question is, how does he do this? He does it in at least three ways. One, he draws people through what he has made. You know, there's a lot of people who sense something when they're out in nature. People, you notice, are drawn to nature, to, to lakes and rivers and mountains and the sea and the sky and the clouds and the stars. People are just drawn. We, they like pictures of those things, and we like to put them on our walls, and we like to have windows. We're drawn to nature. It feels good to be there. That spiritual something in nature that's drawing us, that's the spirit of God, the presence of God. You know, the, the spirit of God still hovers over his creation. God's presence is in the things he has made, and, and people who are somewhat sensitive can, can feel that there. And that's called natural revelation. Do you remember Psalm 19, 1 to 4? It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, last night you could really see that. The moon and the bright stars, beautiful. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There is no words. Their voice isn't heard. But their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But usually natural revelation like that isn't enough to get people who don't know about God to accurately follow God. It certainly doesn't say anything about Jesus. The problem is that people misinterpret natural revelation. They, they misinterpret what they experience and they end up worshiping something in nature because they sense the spirit of God there. So then they begin to worship the wrong thing. They think, they, some of them think there's spirits in nature like the spirit of the, of the aspen tree and they're going to go worship that in a grove or something. Or they think nature itself is God, Gaia or something like that. Or that science explains everything about creation, and so God isn't needed anymore. I don't. But one of the scientists a long time ago said he didn't need that hypothesis. 
we just watched a, a thing about um, Stephen Hawking, and he's kind of there too. Science explains everything, and math explains everything, and of course he's made math into his God then, right? No, people are drawn to God through nature, but they need special revelation to know about Jesus. Now, to understand Jesus, we, we need to have it spelled out clearly from someone we trust. Do you remember we were wanting a plumber here some time ago, and, and what did we do? We were downstairs, you remember? And we were all discussing who in town would be the best plumber. And somebody said, don't, don't go for that guy, go for this guy, and so on. We were looking for testimony of who the best plumber was so that we could get that person to do our work for us. You want testimony. That's another way Jesus draws people, through testimony like that. Draws people through the witness of other people who know God already and has accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Paul explains this. He says it in Romans 10, 13 to 17. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him if they haven't believed in him? And how can they believe without hearing about him? So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Jesus Christ. So the witness of Christ includes preaching as well as conversation about Jesus, a testimony, witness. Jesus told the disciples that in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Yes, Jesus draws people through nature and witness. First, the witness of his disciples. But those disciples did a whole lot more than just talking. What they witnessed was written down so the generations after them could also hear their witness and could understand the special revelation about Jesus. That message from the disciples then, of course, is the New Testament in the Bible. So people need to understand the New Testament in the Bible in order to understand about Jesus, because faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes from the message about Christ. So, Jesus draws people through nature, witness, and the Bible. That's how he does it. But, but how does he cause faith in people? How does, he, how does he get people to trust him? You can know all about him. There's a lot of people who have studied the Bible, and they study it almost like Shakespeare. They know it inside and outside. Some of the commentators I, I read are, are like that. How does Jesus draw people to trust him? That's the mysterious part, I think. It's mysterious because on its face, the gospel, it sounds absurd. Do you believe in some kind of Superman? Come on, really? Paul knew that too. He told the Corinthians that. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 25, so where is the philosopher? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since God's, in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through foolishness the foolishness of the message that's preached. For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But, but wait, what's that word all again in our, in, our, in our verse? He's going to draw all people to himself? these things don't go together. We just said that he, not everybody, and now it says all. What does it mean he draws everyone to Jesus? We don't see it happening. There are lots of people who don't know about Jesus, lots of people who don't care. They, there are a lot of people who think the Bible and the, and the message about Jesus is a bunch of superstitious hooey or some kind of conspiracy that somebody was trying to get power somewhere back then. Yeah, the gospel sounds like foolishness to most people. 
but not to everybody. Paul continues in verses 24 and 25, yet those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, to them Christ is God's power and God's wisdom because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Do you notice what he said? Yet to those who are called, they are the ones who become wise, he says, with God's wisdom. The ones who are called. That solves the mystery, I think. That's how people come to have faith through being drawn by Jesus. Jesus draws everyone, but not everyone is called. Now, from our perspective, we don't really understand this, but it seems as though he calls certain people very specifically. They come to have faith because they not only see nature and not only hear the message of the gospel, God does something in their hearts. C.S. Lewis talked about being surprised by joy when he saw something in nature. I've heard other people talk about their, they felt their hearts strangely warmed as they heard the gospel. There's, it does something in our heart, or if you want to call it your soul, something, your inner person. He puts the desire for God there. He puts a, a promise there, a promise of his love. That's that warmness, I think. He draws us, he woos us, he calls us. Then people can decide how they want to relate to that call of God in their hearts. We have to decide whether we're not going to, whether we are not going to respond to this. Whether or not we're going to respond to him. He's given us that freedom. We can trust him or we can defy him. We can resist him, we can stop responding. Maybe you have been responding and you decided nuts to this, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And you stop responding to God. Some people, they feel that in their hearts and they pretend it's not there. They go home and say, well, that was just something I ate. <laughs> but there are many people who do respond to God's love and they keep on responding. There are many people like that even when they feel like they've dis disappointed him and themselves in some behavior, or even when they're hounded with doubts because the intellect says this is hooey. But your heart says it's real. So you keep on responding to, to the love of God and your brain's going, what? Have you ever had that experience? I, <laughs> I do. You know, um, we keep coming back because God keeps calling us back. He did that with Adam and Eve, you remember, in the garden? They had uh, eaten that fruit they weren't supposed to eat. And they, uh, they took off. They hid from God. And God says, where are you? He's walking in the garden. He says, where are you? And of course, God knew where they were. They were huddling back in the bushes. He knew that. But he wanted to give them a chance to respond. And so he said, where are you? He still does that. Maybe you have experienced the same thing. God loves you and seeks your response. He says, where are you? He wants you to love him. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to trust in Jesus death, resurrection, and ascension because he knows that the love of God is brought to you in that faith, in that trust. That's how it's done. So we've seen that when Jesus is lifted up, he draws everyone to himself, but not everyone responds to the call of God in their hearts. What will you do? What have you done? Do you see him 
You can see him everywhere if you're looking for him. Most of us know that. What do you see there? What do you feel in your heart? Do you feel him there? Is God calling you? Do you put your trust in him? That's what we've been singing about all service, trusting Jesus. But you know, it is your decision. Know this, though, that if God is calling you, he doesn't give up easy. He'll keep at you. It's because true love is like that. It doesn't give up. God doesn't give up because God loves you. He does. Amen.